Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is your girl, Adar, in the cut, <laughs> in your ear, in your speakers. And you're listening to the Digital Sisterhood podcast. This year, I heard a really difficult news um, from a friend. And um, it really kind of knocked me, kind of knocked me off my chair a bit because I had never met somebody um, who had been so, so ill in that way. And so I had a friend who has a, a beautiful girl, beautiful, beautiful girl. And, um, and she had recently found out that she was really, really ill at a really young age. And I just didn't know what to say to her. And I just didn't know how to comfort her because how do you comfort someone you find out that they're, you know, your friend's kid is really sick. And I just, I just didn't know what to do. And thankfully, this podcast, you know, has kind of been a, a an agent of help for me these days <laughs> or these months. And as much as it's helping me, I hope it's helping others. And so I dedicate this episode to that friend. I hope this story gives you a little more and a little energy to keep holding on. And may Allah grant your baby girl shifa. Allahumma amin. So today's story or today's guest is Mariam. I call her Maria Scarborough, <laughs> and for many reasons. She lives in Toronto, Canada. She grew up in Toronto, Canada, and particularly lives in Scarborough. Um, Mariam is the middle child of five. I never knew Mariam personally, but we were always social media friends. One time I actually stumbled upon her blog post um, that really touched me. And I always kept it in the back of my mind. I was like, oh, this is an incredible person. I wonder what her story is. And without further ado... This is her story. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very happy to finally meet sweet, sweet Adar. Oh, <laughs> stop this. Don't make me blush. <laughs> uh, who am I? Honestly, a lot of people know me as Miskeen Mary. That's, that's kind Miskeen of, Mary? Is that the title? Yeah, that's the that's oh title. That's the street name. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of who I am, um, honestly, I feel like I'm a very much mediocre person. Um born and raised in the east side of the city i uh, went to islamic school all of my life everything kind of really started um when i was 17 years old i kind of want to say i was at the peak of my life i graduated with honors i was always involved in school i was in charge of all of the initiatives i've won a lot of awards i was the host of my graduation oh my god very much an overachiever um were you the girl that teachers loved everybody loved no, 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 no. <laughs> Were you a teacher's pet? <laughs> um, kind of, something like that. <laughs> Did you always live in Scarborough? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll have you guys know, this girl has me labeled on her phone as yeah, Mary Scarborough. Scarborough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. In it's the okay. West End, Scarborough is a whole new world. That's what okay. I'm saying. It's a whole new, it's a whole new like, world. Like, that's exactly <laughs> what Scarborough means to me. Yeah. I've been there a total of five times in my life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So yeah. for me, I don't have anybody from Scarborough, and mm -hmm. I felt really cool writing you as Miriam Scarborough. You're not the only one. All my West End friends are like, Miriam Scarborough. Scarborough. <laughs> we have no business. <laughs> we have no business. So it's kind of a big deal when you're friends with people from Scarborough. Yeah. Because you know so, West End people think about West End people. We're a little bit elitist. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, uh, it's nice to have somebody from a different block. Yeah. Uh, but you always live in Scarborough? Yeah, 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 I've always, I've always been in, in the east side of the city, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, and I love it. Yes. I ride for Scarborough. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to hit on Scarborough. <laughs> you guys gave us all the culture and all the noise. <laughs> and all the views. And all the views. You really did. This story begins one weekend when Mari was studying for her grade 11 events functions exam. She had set aside the weekend to really work hard. She was feeling really tired, exhausted, lethargic. So she thought, okay, let me just get up and maybe take a cold shower to wake her up because she really needed to do well on this exam. I remember doubling up on coffee to stay up for the night so that I can study. And um, I was actually taking a shower, like a very cold shower to wake me up so that like I can study for this exam and that I could do well. Um, and, you know, this was the year where like, this is the year when universities are starting to like take you serious. So I was thinking, I was setting myself up for the rest of my life, not knowing that this is what the rest of my life was going to be like. But um, I was in a shower, you know, just washing myself. And then I realized a small little lump about the size of a peanut. I've 
always kind of had lumps in my breast ever since I was in 10th grade. Um, and my mom, she was really, you know, very aware about these kinds of stuff. So she always sent me to see a specialist and they always gave me a breast examination and they all said the same thing. Like, it's just because of your periods. It's because of a hormone. If it's not big and if it's not bothering you, it's probably like a fiber adenoma, which means like just a mass, a benign mass. I remember just, just touching it with my fingers and like really thinking to myself, like, Miriam, I know you watch a lot of Grey's Anatomy, but... <laughs> let's not overreact this can be no you know cancer this this is what the doctor said two years ago that you have a fiber adenoma just a benign tumor and this happens to women all the time and it's just your hormones fluctuating because I had severe um PMS period you know symptoms so I was, I was like this is just a part of that I ignored it for two three months I was living my life <laughs> <laughs> I was living my 17-year-old oh. Mesquite Girl vibe life. Like, I did not pay attention to it. Um, I I wish I did. Um, I know in Islam we're not supposed to say I should have, would have, could have. Yeah. But mm-hmm. um, I kind of fought myself. I remember in the beginning that I really, I don't know. There's not enough... There's not enough education about this kind of stuff, unfortunately, which is why we're having these kinds of conversations today. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, you know, breast examinations, what to look out for, even at the tender age of 17. It really, it's really important. It could save a life. But who's having that car? Who's thinking like that at 17? Bro, like, I'll be honest with you, like, I'm just trying to, like, fit in these skinny jeans at 17. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to, you know, do the coolest thing, be accepted by my surroundings. You think about your whole life in front of you, and you think breast cancer, especially like a cancer, you think it's for old people, older people. Yeah, like you, at, especially you don't think it's for for you. It's not something you need to worry about. Mm-hmm. The only thing you need to worry about is like making it to lunch and having a lunch that's not just an ice cap. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. seventeen, you're not you're not thinking in that way. Yeah, I knew that it was time to bring it to my mom when it like doubled in size so this is when I started to panic and I went to my mom and I was like oh yeah (laughs) I have this little thing in my in my chest I don't know what it is um I'm kind of freaked out and like being so shy because I was like oh oh, yeah I'm shy I don't want to show you and she's like nah yeah (laughs) like I'm your mother I made you (laughs) that's exactly what someone was saying I know every fiber, everything on you. Yeah. Not to s- <laughs> <laughs> show me. Yeah, that's that's how she was. So yeah. she was like, like, let me take a look. She literally poked it, mm-hmm. started reading Quran, ran oh my God. to her phone, <laughs> and she called the doctor and she said, I need a, a specialist, um, a female specialist as soon as possible. SubhanAllah. From there on out, things were kind of a blur from between three months of knowing that I had that tumor up until nine months, um, this tumor just kept on growing and I just kept on getting ignored. My doctor kept on going on these really weird vacation and trips and <laughs> she was super busy and she kept telling me, you know, this is just a fiber adenoma. My first experience with that doctor, the expectations versus reality was crazy. I came into that hospital with confidence thinking, you know, this is a female doctor. This is a fellow woman. She'll understand at least my worries, right? She came into the room. She didn't even give me eye contact. She went straight into putting in her gloves and um, getting everything ready. She said, hey, Miriam, you know, like, I heard you have a little a little scare, a little worry. Um, don't worry. I can probably tell you, you know, you're 17 years old. Like, this is probably nothing. Um, but we're going to take a look. And she is not looking at me. She's already undressing me. Like, she's moving my gown away just to take a look and she's like which one is it oh my my gosh I just literally had to bite the inside of my cheek and be like wow this is really dehumanizing I'm just gonna let this experience pass and I was thinking listen she's the specialist here I know nothing she knows everything um it's like that Matilda moment you're big I'm small (laughs) that's definitely what I felt I said you know what she knows um more than me so I'm, if she's telling me there's nothing to worry about, she studied this, so there's nothing to worry about. And she really gave me that reassurance, like, oh, this lump is very movable. Usually if it's cancer, it's really attached to your chest. It's really hard to move. So she said, this is really movable. I feel really confident about this. 
um, we're going to take care of this and you're going to be fine. You're going to go right back to school. The crazy thing is like the urgency, right? That if, 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 if there is potentially a possibility that you are sick and the urgency to find, to figure out that's the, if that's the reality, it is not as urgent to them as it is for you. And that's crazy because it, it reminds me of this quote, which was um, doctors are for black women the way police are to black men. And in this situation, it rings true. Because look at all the opportunities they had to diagnose her, to help her, and to catch it early. And yet, it was one barrier after another, after another. I cannot imagine what this experience would be like for people who cannot advocate for themselves, right? Who, who can't see what's going on. She really, she was excited for me because she was like, don't even worry. Like, this is, but in a very narcissistic, aggressive way, not in a reassuring, comforting way. Like, more so, like, I have science on my side. You have, like, you know, emotions on your side. Like, there's, we're, we're going to win here. So getting referred to a, a breast specialist especially is so hard. Like, sometimes you're on a waiting list for, like, four months. And it really puts women at risk for progression of whatever the tumor is, whether it's benign or malignant. And um, it was really unfortunate because I got to see her and then she's like, I'm going on a trip, I'm going on vacation for like a month. And when I come back, um, if there's any issue, then we'll consider a biopsy. But when I get the biopsy, then it's going to take a few weeks to get the results back. <laughs> yeah. And, you, and and we know how fast that, that progressed. Do you remember? How wow. long was that period between, like, it's small and then it became as big as it did? I want to say nine months. Wow. Yeah. It was nine months of me um, initially finding it, ignoring it for a few months, taking it to my mom, my mom, me and my mom being put on the waiting list, and then finally seeing her, her going on vacation, me coming back, you know, um, asking for the biopsy. I don't think we should do a biopsy. Me going to the hospital. Then I got diagnosed. Wow, that's like a year. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Subhanallah. Yeah. Mariam and her mom left the doctor's office feeling optimistic that they were okay and that maybe, you know, it isn't as bad and that maybe it isn't what they think it is and it's just something, you know, minor. And so they left with that, you know, hope. Yet Mariam was still getting sicker and sicker until everything came crashing down one day when the money went to work. I remember I was working. I was working at a university as a tour guide. And I had such an amazing manager at the time. She was so accommodating. She knew I was going through something. And she always said, you know, you can always come and sit in my office if you just, like, want to breathe. Because I had, like, severe anxiety at the time. And I told her my concerns. I'm like, like, I have this lump in my breast. I don't know what it is. Doctors are not really taking it serious. But I have a lot of anxiety. You know, it's, it's still ruminating in the back of my head. And um, she was like, listen, whatever whatever the outcome is, is we're here for you. We're going to accommodate. We're here to support you always. Um, and I remember I just really wanted to do my job well. Like everything that I do, I always want to do it well. I just finished a tour and I had a small break and I had to start my other tour soon. And I remember sitting down and I brought out my lunch and I was starting to feel really dizzy. And I was like, oh, I might pass out. <laughs> like, I'm kind of familiar with this feeling, you know, anemia. It touches your toes. It makes you feel lightheaded. So let me just get up and get myself a glass of water. So I got up, and as soon as I got up, I saw stars. Wow. <laughs> and I just dropped on the ground. And I woke up to all my coworkers, like literally so many people around me, so embarrassing. Like, I woke up with all these people around me. And then um, there's this guy like saying my name, like, Miriam, Miriam. And I was like, who's this guy calling for me? <laughs> Paramedics, one thing about them, they're so loud. Like, they're really trying to wake you up. <laughs> they're trying to do, or they're pinching you. They're yeah. putting something up your nose. They're rubbing your chest. Oh, yeah. Miriam. Yeah, like, and it's like the, it's like aggressive. Very aggressive. It's very hard the way they push. It's like, are you doing CPR, sir? What is yeah. going on? It yeah. worked, though. It did. It woke me up. I woke up. <laughs> and I remember feeling flustered and embarrassed. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I have a tour. That's all I can think of. Like, I have, I have to give a tour soon. 
And I saw my manager, Kim, and I just looked so disappointed. Like, I honestly was crying because, like, I couldn't believe that this happened at work. I got up and I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just didn't eat. Like, I made up some lie. I said, I didn't eat breakfast. I'm anemic. Like, I'm fine. I'm okay. And then the paramedics were like, listen, you have a choice. We can take you to the hospital or we can leave you here. Like, you just let us know what you want to do. And I was like, I I think I'm fine. I really want to do my job. Whatever. So I just went to the washroom to freshen up. And then I came back and my manager and my coworkers, they bought me all this food. They quickly ran to like the gift shop. They got me like flowers and a teddy bear. And they're like, Mary, we can't believe like you're still here. Please go home. But also like you don't have to do a tour for the evening. You can just do some admin stuff and then um, we'll just take you as you are. We'll accept you as you are. That was probably one of the first few times that I felt really hurt because I was just battling all these doctors and all these uncertainties of my own mind. Um, so it was really nice to hear even if it was from, like, my Adan yeah. <laughs> manager, like, mm. it's fine. Like, I'll take you as you are. Like, however you can function, I'll take you as you are. That's when I texted my mom. Oh, yeah, I fainted. Yeah. <laughs> she said, I don't care. We are going to the hospital. <laughs> Your mom's over it. She's over it. She hates it here. She said, we are going to the hospital. You're going to the best hospital. You know, we both know that Children's Hospital is one of the best hospitals. Yes, it is. In North America, she said, we're going and we're demanding answers. Like, we're about to riot. I'm not going to leave that <laughs> hospital until you get some answers. Shout out to some of my moms. Shout out to all moms. The resilience. Yeah, so they, they would riot for their kids. They really would. Yeah. <laughs> but I was down, like, 25 pounds. I was, like, severely anorexic. I was already a skinny girl, and I became even skinnier. And... um. Uh, my hair started to fall out, which is not normal. Your hair falls out when you start treatment, when you start chemo. But my body was under so much stress and I was so skinny that like I started to ha- have a lot of hair thinning and a lot of balding around my head. And we still didn't see that as red flags, which I'm really surprised about. But, um, you know, when you have these doctors severely gaslighting you, telling you like, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's fine. You're overthinking it. Don't research it. Um you really start to think whether or not they have it after you. But <laughs> my mom texted me. She said, I, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive down with your dad. And um, we're going to see what's going on. And she didn't come with just my dad. She came with my whole family. Oh, my God. Of course <laughs> you did. My aunts and uncles and everything. <laughs> <laughs> they were. She was serious when she said they're going to riot. Yeah. She r- wasn't playing. She bought she bought bodies <laughs> to riot. She was here for the Allah. good fight. May for Allah the bless her. Fight. May Allah I bless mean. her. Because the way that the tumor grew... It grew literally from the, like such a small size to so massive, very visibly noticeable. It grew to 11 by 13 by 16 centimeters. So that's length, width, and the um, the density of it. Yeah. And you can visibly see, you know, there's this mass on me and it was weighing me down. It was very hot to touch and, and very painful too. Yeah. And I'll never forget in the emergency room, they took one good look at it and they said, it's not going to be good news. The the emergency room? The emergency room. The emergency room. The The, people at the emergency looked at it and knew. Yeah, they knew. And and you're telling me the doctor you were telling months before. Definitely. Who's probably taken at that point CTs, they've taken MRIs, right? She's seen it. She didn't even do a biopsy. She She, didn't issue for all of that. Yeah, she literally was like... When I come back from my trip, then we're going to do a biopsy and it's going to take a couple of weeks for the results to come back. I went into that children's hospital and they got me an MRI that night. They were like so angry as well. Like, why didn't you come sooner? Like, mom, when you see a child that has a tumor this big and my mom was crying, like, I didn't know. I didn't know. The the lady, she just kept reassuring me. Oh, my God. And I was like, you know what? Like, it is what it is. I can't imagine what your mom felt like because it felt like she could have did. You know, it feels like you could have did something, Mm -hmm. right? My mom had a lot of um, survivor's guilt. Like, she felt very, very guilty, like, Hoya, if I knew you didn't have to do, you know, such radical treatments. But um, that's the great thing about Islam. Like, we know so much about Qadar and we know so much about Tawakal. Like, we're just always able to come out of these kinds yeah. of things. Well, we recognize that things are, are happening for its for its good. You know, like, we recognize there's only so much we can do and that everything really is in Allah's hands. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, I, I, sometimes, Wallahi, Miriam, I, I look at others and I think, I don't know how they do in life. Yeah. Without Allah. Like, I, I look at them like, <laughs> I don't know how y'all very real are surviving mm-hmm. without knowing Allah you know what I'm saying like and what you know what I know to be true mm-hmm. and it's because it's, it's, it's like life sucks mm-hmm. 
life sucks. I was there for a few days, actually, until they got all the testing out. CT scan, MRI, PET scan. Um, I did every single x-ray. <laughs> um, all the tests, like, I literally can't even recall. It's such a blur, but it was just every other hour, some nurses were waking me up like, hey, buddy, hey, sweet girl, <laughs> we're going to take you for a test. And um, it was through those four days that I was obviously very distressed it didn't help that my whole, my whole family were literally standing up against the walls around the room, up into the hallway. They didn't want to sit, just reading Quran and praying. Oh and I felt like that dramatized it for me. I, was, I started yeah, to panic. I was yeah. like, this is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like a taxi. Like, oh my you know? God, I bet it did. But it's, it must be so like, I bet to them it was like, well, this woman, this girl has people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was there for four days. The doctor finally came out and they said, Miriam, you have a cancer, very rare and aggressive, called rhabdomyosarcoma. It's a cancer that um, affects the muscles in your body. And they usually, um, they usually don't come out in 17-year-old women. So this is really rare. It's already a very rare cancer. It's 1% of all other cancers. And it's also really rare that you have it. So we're kind of at a loss of words here. So they said, unfortunately, we're going to have to get to know you for a really long time. And we're going to set you up with a team. So this is when my mom chimed in. And she said, how long do I have? How long... Can I keep her to myself? How long, you know, can I take her away from this hospital business so that I can kind of do my own thing, take matters into my own hands in, ter in terms of like um, natural remedies and, you know, spiritual remedies? She was like, I just, I want some time with my baby girl before she starts all of this. Because the plan that they set out was a very intense chemotherapy regimen radiation um, and surgery and possibly multiple surgeries depending on whether or not the residue of the cancer is still in my body. So they said eight weeks. And in those eight weeks was a really fun time mm. for me. <laughs> my mom, she chopped it up. She chopped up some ginger, some onions, some mm. garlic, some honey, some black seed oil. <laughs> <laughs> All and every single kind of inflammatory um, ingredient that she can get her hands on that had both spiritual and scientific evidence behind it. My mom, she used it on me, which was good for my immune system, definitely. Um, I had to drink a lot of really fun smoothies during mm. this time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, which I feel like is a really, it's kind of one of the main takeaways of my story today. My mom did Quran Sar. Mm. Let's normalize talking about our Quran Sar story. Yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's about time. <laughs> yeah, let's let's normalize it. In Islam, uh, we were taught that Qur the Quran is Shifa, a form of healing. And so we also believe that Allah is truly the one that cures. And things like medicine and doctors and honey and black seed oil are all mu all means of cure, but it's ultimately Allah that cures. And so um, somebody might be taking medicine or taking these remedies, and they're also um, reading verses from the Quran onto a person to heal them. All of these are avenues and agents for healing. And so Muslims do more than just, you know, doctors and medicine. But they also read verses of the Quran because there's shifa there as well. And it's just as valuable and important and an important means to do. And so we do all of these things. So her obviously her mom wanted to to do these first, right? Before we instill the poison and all the things that might make her sicker, let's do these means first. Let's 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 read the Quran. Let's let's do the prophetic remedies, um, the natural remedies first, and then um, wake our, uh, work our way down. You know, there's a lot of research behind um, people who are spiritual and how they recover versus people who aren't. Like it's scientifically proven that people who um, believe in whatever that they believe in, mm -hmm. they 
the, the outcome in terms of like positive thinking really like improves their quality of life and their yeah. prognosis rate. Mm-hmm. And my mom knew that, you know, 14 years of putting all of her kids into Islamic school. She knew that. So mm-hmm. um, I had a lot of Quran read on me every other day, sometimes with one sheikh, sometimes with five. Um, you know, drinking the Quran water, mm-hmm. um, listening to Quran all night, um, just kind of the whole nine yards. And if you were to ask me whether or not this actually made a difference in my prognosis rate, I can tell you as a fact that it did. Because one thing that doctors do is that they're very aggressive when they're telling you the news. If it's bad, it's bad. If it's good, it's good. So they told me in the beginning, like, you have, like, a 30% prognosis rate. Like, this is a very large tumor. Um, You're going to need such intense chemotherapy. We don't even know if you're going to react to it the way that we want to. We don't even know if you're going to tolerate it. And we don't know how the surgery is going to turn out. So we're just, we're dealing with a lot of I don't knows. So they said, you know, your prognosis rate is 30%. So what does that mean, prognosis rate of 3%? What does that, in simpler terms, what does that mean? It's like survival, right? But in terms of treatment, like Mm -hmm. prognosis basically, I could be wrong if anyone's listening on our (laughs) Prognosis basically means like in terms of you actually doing your treatments um, and your like health condition, this is the rate, like whether or not it's going to be successful. And so usually they have this five-year interval and your prognosis rate, like depending on your treatment, it can go up or down. So for me, it was like 30%, like 30% that you're going to be fine. Honestly, because I was very naive at the time and like I didn't really understand what was really going on, even though I was 17 years old, I didn't take it too serious. I always viewed it as like something that was like diabetes or like something that was conditional that I could work on and that I was going to be okay. That's really what I'm so thankful for Allah um, for for giving me because I never ever thought that I was going to die like I always knew that the tomorrow was going to come if it was written for me tomorrow was going to come and I knew that you know even if it wasn't written for me then it's okay so I didn't really take it too serious when I'm hearing like 30% prognosis rate I'm just like okay yeah okay like it is what it is I didn't do treatment yet how do you know how do they know <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I had like severe conviction at that time. I just, I knew I was going to be okay. Like I knew I was going to come out of this. Death never crossed my mind. After that, I went into my surgery. It was my first major surgery, September 23rd, 2016. I'll never forget. Mm. It was an eight hour surgery. I remember I was telling my best friend at the time, can you please text me and let me know if it rains? Because there was, like, a probability of whether or not it was going to rain. And it rained. Like, I remember after the surgery, I looked at my text messages and she said, Miriam, it rained. And I just knew that Allah was watching me and that his mercy was, like, you know, watching over me and that I was going to be okay. Um, And that surgery was long and hard. It was... (laughs) really aggressive i had a radical mastectomy um like more radical than usual they had to take out a lot of muscle like so they didn't even just take out the breast they took out the muscle behind it so really i had an open wound so open that like you can see the rib cage of my chest and like you can literally see like my lung just behind it and they took out this muscle that was also connected to my back And then because you have an open gaping wound, they took out this huge piece of flesh from my thigh so that they can do a skin transplant. And they took that skin and they stitched it to my chest. And so now I was left with these two really big, uncomfortable open wounds. I did that surgery. I came out of it. um, Trying to live for those few days was really hard. I had to relearn how to walk. You know, I couldn't eat for days. And also, there's a lot of PTSD that comes with hospitals and surgeries. And if I knew that I was going to have multiple surgeries after, I really would have paced myself for what was about to come. But I did that surgery. And that's when the chemotherapy started. I had six different chemotherapy drugs given to me. And it was 
hard. I was allergic to a lot of the steroids, which really help you with chemotherapy. I couldn't tolerate all, every single chemotherapy drug, drug they given me. I couldn't tolerate it. So I couldn't take it at 100% dosage. I can only take it at 15% dosage. And they had to use different chem- chemotherapies for me because my body reached toxicity. So um, every round that I did, I couldn't wake up for days. I couldn't even speak. I didn't even, they thought like I fell into a coma because I didn't even have the energy to lift my eyes open, to go to the washroom by myself. I had to get a catheter put in. I couldn't eat. So they gave me, um, they put a tube up my nose that like connects to your stomach. I would throw that up. So they punctured a hole in my stomach and they put a tube there instead. And every single time I did a round of chemo, the skin on your body dies. So I became severely dark. My nails became so tender that they started to fall off. And then um, every single round, the skin, the healthy skin that they took from my thigh and from my chest started to die. So they became infected and they would fall off. And every single day I had to get wound care changes. Every single kind of infection that your body could possibly have I had I had a throat infection I had a lung infection I had a stomach infection I had a large intestine infection I had a bowel infection (laughs) and then on top of that I couldn't walk anymore so I was using a walker I was always on a wheelchair and what else I coded blue once which they call a code blue for when like Either your, you stop breathing or your heart stops. I coded blue once. I fell into septic shock once. So my organs started to die. And that wasn't a fun time in the ICU. The ICU is really scary. <laughs> and um, pretty much it was just 10 months of hell. And I remember going to my team. A lot of people don't know this about me. But I quit. I did not want to finish chemotherapy. So I went to the doctor and I said... I've come to the conclusion, you know, with my family that I don't want to do this anymore. It feels like it's doing more damage than good. And I'm really tired. And she was like, you have one month left. I literally had one month left. And she was like, please, like, like, we'll just do a really, really small dosage. But I was so broken and tired. And it looked like I was half of what I originally looked like. And... I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm just like, doctor, please, I'm tired. I just, I want to go home. I want to spend time with my family. I was inpatient for almost a year. She said one more month. Mariam decided to stick it out one more month. Despite the fact that she went through months and weeks of difficulty and treatment and another month to stay away from her family. But she stuck it out and it paid off. I finally did it. I finished my month and I finished my treatment. I was cleared NED, which which stands for um, no evidence of disease. Wow. And I was in remission. Good. Wow. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. Yes. You got the best news. I did. And this is when a conversation with my doctor happened. Um, she took me to the side because I had a great, huge, loving team. And they they were so cute. They loved me so much. They threw, like, this little party for me. (laughs) And my doctor, like, she was such a buzzkill. She took me to the side and she said, "Um, like, I hate to be this person, but I don't feel confident in your treatment. You only did 15% and you didn't even tolerate it. Your body reached toxicity. I really want you to do one more year of chemo, but called maintenance chemo, which is a chemo that you take at home, which means that you wouldn't even be able to get the support from nurses when you're like severely throwing up blood 4 a.m. in the morning you wouldn't even get support you would just be like stuck with whatever resources you have at home with a very tired and worried mother I said respectfully I'm not doing that um I can't I can't do that anymore and she said you know 
what's really surprising to me is that your like prognosis rate actually like skyrocketed. Like it went from 30% to 80%. Like wow. I, I feel like you're basically 80% in remission, but for some reason I feel like it's going to relapse, which is such a shitty thing for a doctor to tell. Especially a, a day like when you were just having a party, she could have gave you that moment yeah, she to enjoy it. That she could have gave you a week. I don't <laughs> like she could have did it at any other time. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, to tell you that news, you know what I'm saying? But, like, how many good days did you have that year? You know what I'm saying? So she did not give me that day. So when she said this to me, I was 18. I officially turned 18. So I had my own autonomy. I had my own agency. And I said, I'm not doing that. And she said, well, Miriam, how do you know? I said, I know. <laughs> I know how I got better. I know why I got better. And it's not you know the it's not a spontaneous recovery that's what they labeled me as like this was a miraculous spontaneous miracle recovery. yeah a miracle so they were like we don't like how, we don't know how this happened and I was like I know I know why this happened I know how this happened and I'm gonna go with that I'm gonna go with the reason why I got better I'm not gonna base my life off of your probability I'm not gonna base it off of your 50% chance 30% chance 80% chance I'm gonna go off of my means and if I relapse I relapse it's written for me and and if I have to come back I know there's gonna be resources for me because my lord has put every single remedy for every disease on this earth and I will find it and I will attain it and that's going to be on my terms because I've been working on your terms for a year and I'm not going to be doing it for another year. Um, so her recommendation come back a year, which is based on her fear. Yeah. But you had trust in Allah SWT. Yes. You know, you had conviction that he got you here for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that was enough to go off. And for her, it was like, what? No. Like, exactly. for her scientifically, like, no, we could do more. We can. I never, a day in my life that year, Allah is my witness, I never thought I was going to die. So what makes you think that I'm going to think that now? Now, especially after getting that you're in remission. Yeah. Why would you now believe that you're going to, that you should, out of no evidence. Yeah. There's no evidence you're going to relapse. Exactly. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it make more sense to accept that this is the reality and that you did went to emission, you're always going to be in that position? Yeah, like, if I got the NED, respectfully, I'm not coming back here. I'm not going <laughs> to... Respectfully. <laughs> respectfully, I'm not coming back and I'm not going to be throwing up blood. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm good off of that. Yeah, that was a year of hell. <laughs> oh, my God. Whatever Allah has planned for me is the best for me. And I felt like Allah was setting me up for greatness. Allahu Akbar. I find this so miraculous because we all go through hardship, right, Miriam? We yeah. all go through it. Mm-hmm. And many of us go through hardship thinking we're not going to come. Um, I would say a lot of us go through hardship thinking when it's the light at the end of the tunnel. Definitely. So, um, and, 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 and a lot of us can go into this hole, think it's, it's a wrap. Many of us don't even think good of Allah, mm-hmm. even in hardship, right? Yeah. It's always easy to think good of Allah and ease. But it's, it, to me, it's so incredible that you went through that and still thought good of Allah Sata and had conviction that in this difficult time, you knew undoubtedly ease was on its way. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's and cause you, to, a, to the degree you were dealing. You know what I mean? Like some of us are dealing with just other things, yeah. but we don't even have that, that, uh, that mercy to have that conviction. And that truly is from Allah. Mm-hmm. Like truly, like to have that contentment conviction that you it's from Allah. It is. I think now listening to you, I don't think I'm gonna see my hardships. It's like I'm gonna realize that like yes, they're hard, mm-hmm. but like Allah sees us through all of it. He does, doesn't he? Like mm-hmm. every time, always. Fun thing about cancer is that like once you finally, um, once you finish treatment, you're in remission for five years, mm-hmm. and then after five years, they declare you like officially cancer free. So you're mm-hmm. wiped from all of the medical systems. So just this year, I became alhamdulillah. Um, cancer free five years. Five years yeah, now. Five years. This year. Yeah. Twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Big W. So now you're completely wiped. Yeah, I. I used you're to, officially mm-hmm. cancer free. Yeah, I always had to take MRIs and scans within the past five years, and yeah, now they to said make sure. 
live your best life you don't well, ever you don't have, have to come, come back, back here oh, yeah so i oh now lost contact with them but oh. they were very emotional every yeah. time i called them once a year they're crying oh <laughs> my god so within those four or five years that i was in remission from cancer I lived my life. I went back to school. I became an overachiever, perfectionist again. I started working. Um, just like how in the first time I was at my peak, I again got at my peak. But this time I wasn't doing it with gratitude or remembrance of Allah. The things that I did to myself physically and spiritually were not to be aligned with someone who just got tested with their health. Let's just kind of leave it at that. I lived a very ignorant life for four or five years, and let's just say that my lesson my lesson was not learned <laughs> from that experience. If you were to really ask me and to check in with myself and hold myself accountable, I did not learn that lesson that I needed to be learned. So September... 2020 I had a surgery reconstruction surgery for my mastectomy to make me look like a girl again make me look symmetrical make me look normal again my plastic surgeon told me Miriam this surgery is not going to be easy I don't know if you're ready for it I said listen because of COVID it kept on getting canceled I by the way have had nine surgeries within those five years the reason being because I kept trying to get that reconstruction sur reconstructive surgery but each time I would go in get an implant it would get infected or I would try to you know do something else oh you have to ha get scar removal surgery and just so many things like there was keloids we have to remove all the keloids and things like that and every single time I did a surgery I had to drop everything and put my life on pause I had to quit my job. I had to quit school. I had to feel sick, really, really sick for two weeks, which was very triggering for me um, post-recovery. And they give you pain medication that you, I feel like nobody talks about the withdrawals that you feel when you get pain medication. You start to feel anxious. And that's what really heavily impacted my mental health within the past five years. And with a bad mental health came bad decisions in life. And so that's kind of how I was living for five years. So my plastic surgeon said in September 2020, this is the final one. This is the big bang. We're, we're going to do it all. We're going to do a specific surgery where they like do fat transfer. And it's just kind of long and annoying to explain. But she said it's going to be 10 hours. So it's going to be longer than my original surgery. And it's going to be really aggressive and really hard. But the sad news is, is that you don't have a lot of recovery time in the hospital. Usually you would be here for like a week and a half. We're only going to have you here for three days. And after that, you're going to have to go home and recover yourself. And you're going to have to have nurses come into your home, which was really like I just got sent home not ready. And um, that has a lot to do with what I have now. So I did that surgery. I said, you know what? I'm ready for it. I've dealt with a lot in life, so I feel like I should be fine. <laughs> and boy, was I wrong. I did that surgery. It was easily one of the hardest surgeries I ever did in my life. Out of all nine of them, that was the hardest one. Alhamdulillah. And that surgery really rocked my world. <laughs> Getting a little emotional because... No, no, it's okay. The, the tissue is there. Thanks. <laughs> we say that at every episode. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan, shout out to Josh. He's not running across the hall in um, the studio. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I did that surgery and I got really sick. And if I knew, like, if I knew before my surgery that those were the last few days that I was going to be healthy, like, I, I really would have done better. I really would have done more. And I did that surgery and I couldn't, I couldn't walk straight for like three months. I was literally crouched down like a grandmother because <laughs> oh I had a severe open wound um, in my abdomen. It got infected because apparently my body hates me and... My breast wound became like 
deformed. So I didn't even get what I wanted to get out of all these years of doing nine surgeries. And can you believe they still are expecting for me to do more? I officially put up my white flag. I said, I'm done. And they said, you have three to six months of recovery. So I just was on bed rest for three to six months. And that's not what any human being should do for three to six months. They can't be in pain and they can't be, you know, depressed because of this. And so many things was happening, like, in my personal life with the friendships that I had. And and also because of, like, the pandemic, I developed, like, severe pandemic anxiety. So my mental health was in the trash. And I didn't feel motivated to exercise and go on walks. And so with this combination of lack of physical activity and like, you know, severe mental health issues, I developed chronic illnesses. And these are chronic illnesses that, you know, they might never leave my life. And it's been almost a year of like suffering. Yeah. Of just me being sick. Yeah. And dizzy and tired. Mm-hmm. And traumatizing events in the hospital, mm-hmm. emergency room, and severe depression. And I just wasn't doing well. And every time I would go and get blood work, it said, oh, it's just normal. Your blood work is normal. You're fine. This is all in your head. (sighs) Finally, they diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome in POTS, which is like this postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And there are two chronic illnesses that come to you when you've experienced severe trauma, mental and physical. And it's degenerative, like it gets worse. Some people forget about being on a wheelchair. Some people can't even leave their beds. And people who get diagnosed with this, it's it's really like they're chosen. Like, they just wake up one day sick. And I really, I can't pinpoint when, but I just woke up one day really, really sick. And I haven't been, I don't even remember what it feels like to be healthy again. Like, I haven't had a really good day in a really long time. And... There's no medication for it. There's no cure. There's no relief. They're not going to give you pain medication. They don't believe your pain. You know, they just give you antidepressants because they think that you're thinking your pain. You're thinking yourself into pain. So, alhamdulillah, I, I've been living with that since, up until this day. But there's this really crazy moment that I experienced recently that... I wanted to to share with you, which was back when I had cancer and I just came out of my first major surgery, my principal and my teachers came to visit. And as I said earlier, like I went to an Islamic school. So there's this Egyptian old lady that pointed at me and she said, you are so lucky. And in my head, mentally, I'm thinking that's really offensive. Like, I'm literally on my deathbed. What do you mean? <laughs> but I said that mentally. Like, I didn't, yeah. I didn't really say that out loud to her. And she continued and she said, Oh, to have all of your sins removed because of this trial. You're the luckiest person in this room. I really feel that today. I really feel lucky in every room that I enter and I hope one day that I can face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I can say thank you for choosing me because Allah tests whom he loves and I feel his mercy and I feel his love even though some days I fall to my knees with my head to the ground and I think this is really hard this is really hard But just like Prophet Ayyub, when he was tested with his health, he kept telling his wife, I had 80 years of health, what's 18 years of sickness? And he never complained. All he asked was for Allah's mercy. And, you know, we're all humans. Prophet Ayyub was even human. He had human feelings. So he said in a dua one day, he said, Ya Allah, 
this calamity has befallen me. But still, I feel your mercy. And even though that this calamity has befallen me, I feel his mercy. I really do. And Wallahi, a lot of people, they like to, you know, when Allah says, with hardship comes ease, and indeed with hardship comes ease, you know, not only is it a promise, but he puts a lot of emphasis on it because he he says it twice. So his promise is always going to come true regardless. But I think this is really important because a lot of people, they think that it's after the hardship that you're going to feel ease. But for me, alhamdulillah, like, it's in this hardship that I feel ease. I do. It's this taqwa, this God consciousness that I have. It's this remembrance of Allah. And also, I met my best friend through this illness, alhamdulillah. Wallahi, if going through this process meant that I got to meet her, I would do it again and again and again. <laughs> She, like, has literally... I'm going to rant about her for a second. Yeah, go ahead. She deserves it. Give her a shout-out. Yes, yeah, she watches. She listens to the podcast. <laughs> What's her name? I'm actually not going to say her name because okay. she's so beautiful inside and out that she literally hates <laughs> recognition. Yeah, recognition yeah. She hates it so much. <laughs> but literally, like... And I met her just when I got sick, right? She wakes up in the middle of the night to pray for me every single day all those my witness she does not skip a day of sending me duas to read every time i go to the hospital and i come out severely traumatized she's out my house <laughs> literally the same day she's out my house with flowers and bubble tea <laughs> and like you know zam zam water and a quran or some sort of like book for me to read because she knows that i love i love books so Alhamdulillah, she's my ease to my to my hardship. And I really feel like, you know, whenever I make dua, I sometimes forget that the way that it's getting answered, right? Allah says, yes, or he says, yes, but not right now. Or I have something better for you. But to anyone who's listening that has chronic illnesses, I, I just want you to know that Allah is saying all three. He's saying yes, not right now, but I have something better for you. And I really feel like Allah is taking this time with me so that I can do the internal work, that I can do the, the, the spiritual construction that I need to do so that I'm able to be great again, just like how he did the first time. And what a blessing it is to get to retake this test. You know, a lot of people, they don't get to retake their tests. And if I get to feel the pain in the illness so that my friends and family don't feel the pain or the illness, wallahi, I will do it. <laughs> I will do it. And if this is protecting me from things that I could have been doing, especially in the ways that I have within the past five years, I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm so grateful. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected me, the plans that I had, he really is the best of planners. <laughs> he really creates master masterpieces. And I'm just, I'm sitting back and I'm watching mine get unfold. And alhamdulillah, like, my recovery might be in a year or might be in 40 years. But all I know is that I've accepted this. And that I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy that I'm I'm able to embrace Allah's love in ways that you know people can't and I'm so happy that I get to be the luckiest in the room again and you know with the patience of Ayub and you know the strength of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know I feel like I'm gonna be I'm gonna be okay I'm gonna be just fine like I'm good and you know even when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when his son Ibrahim, when he was passing, him too, like, you know, even the prophets had feelings. Even the prophets felt grief. So he said, the eyes are shedding tears and, and the heart feels grief, but we will only say what pleases our Lord. So I hope that for the rest of my life, I can only utter things that please my Lord 
and that I only live my life with the purpose of being his slave. And I now only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like Ayub, don't give me my health back until you are the most pleased with me. Until you are the most happy with me. And until you know, because you've written out my life, until you know that I'm going to devote my life to you. So that's that's the story. <laughs> oh my God. I'm literally... I'm so sorry, Jonathan. Your home mic's probably wet. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know, in Islam, um, when we think about, like, you know, being tested with illness... Alhamdulillah, we have this perspective where we understand that like whenever a calamity like that hits you, it's a form of expediation of sin and not a punishment. I remember a time when my grandmother, when she was uh, suffering from ovarian cancer, um, and anytime she was in pain in her room, she would say, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. Like, in, 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 like she was grateful for this painful experience. And I thought, what? And I said to her, Ayeyo, you know, grandmother, why why are you, you know, happy about this, like, difficult time? Don't you want to die in peace? Why would you want to die in agony? Like, you know, like, this is, this, is, this is a sad time. And she's like, no, Allah favors me. Like, that was her thing. She's like, I get to, you know, pass away because we're all going to pass away. But I was also awarded the gift of having my sins expediated before I meet Allah how many people get that opportunity and I thought she was wild at 12 years old but Islam is that beautiful right it it takes all of our difficult moments and they puts it puts it in perspective and we take everything um as a blessing I know that many people are you know are being tested in the same way Mariam is being tested and so I wanted to ask her what advice would you give to others who might be might be in the same space that you are i would probably say that it's okay to break you know just like how you broke you're allowed to break you're allowed to complain to allah and say ya allah this is hard <laughs> this is difficult i know this is your test and i know this is a means through your love but you know, Yara, please grant me relief or strength or sabr to get through this. But just know that Allah's help is always near. He's never abandoned you. And whatever Allah has chosen for you is better for you. And he's protecting you for something else. Just like how he's protected me and my my ways and my ignorance. He's protected me in so many ways. So, Wallahi, I would just say take it day by day and to reevaluate why we are here why we are put on this earth which is to be a humble slave of Allah and to commit to that because before you before you are chronically ill you are Muslim first and foremost so you have to you have to respect that first um and you know I see you I hear you and I love you and I hope you get well soon <laughs> inshallah Reminds me of when I think of Ayub Ali Salam, I would think um, the part, you know, where Allah says, like, wherever he found Ayub, he found him patient. And I pray for everyone who might be might be being might be might be at the moment being tested with their health. I pray that Allah finds you wherever you are patient. This episode is brought to you by Beautiful Light Studios. I live. I love to give a shout out, like I always do, to my sis, my friend, and my producer, Mona Sheikh Omar. I don't know if um, if all of our listeners know, but we have a Patreon page that supports this podcast. If you're interested in supporting this podcast and it's it's been beneficial to you and it's been important to you, help us, help us keep going. <laughs> join our uh, join our membership on our Patreon. You can find it on uh, Patreon's website or our website at www.thedigitalsisterhood.com. Um, I also love to give a shout out to our sponsors. I'd love to give a shout out to our Patreon members for sponsoring this episode. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Halima Gale and Fatima S. Jazakallah Khair for sponsoring.